As as all of you probably know, we have two types of of uh, weekly webinar meetings. Uh, one type is the subject matter experts like Gita, who's on here, who talked about genomic expression. Um, and we then query them and people get an opportunity to find out what the services are and often they then can you know get access. The other type of meeting we have is the type we're having today, which is where a patient reviews their case. I, I'm, I'm looking at Mike Yancey who did that, uh, Brian's done that, Rick has done that. Um, and so that gives us an opportunity to get feedback from the community. And often what we find is the patients have uh, explored some of the same sorts of issues and can share their experience, what they learned, what worked, what didn't work with each other. So that's the kind of session we're going to be having today. So Amit will be presenting his case and the questions that he has and then opening it up for comments and shared experiences. Thanks, Amit. Thanks, Brad. I assume you guys can see my screen. Yes, the Redwoods. The, the Redwoods. Uh, it's a picture I took about a year back uh, in California, Redwoods. Uh, I just thought it's appropriate for the title, what I'm dealing with. <laughs> so I'm a visual person. I take a lot of pictures. Um, um, I think you guys know me, uh, but just wanted to introduce, you know, who we are, <laughs> right? Um, uh, my wife, as you might have seen in the description, uh, this picture was taken late last year, family picture. Uh, my wife is a physician herself. She's a hospitalist at Kaiser here in the Sacramento area. We live in Granite Bay, Sacramento area. My daughter is 21. She's about to graduate in a month from uh, NYU Tisch uh, in theater and film. Um, so one of my goals and current goal is just to be actually able to get there and travel to her graduation, which, as you'll see, is not a very trivial thing right now for me um, as we go through my journey. But it's it's one of my immediate goals that, yes, I want to be able to, in a month or at least three weeks from now, I want to be there in New York to see her graduate. And my son is freshman at UCSC. He just started um, uh, this year. So both kids are out of the house. And this is our lovely dog. Biscotti is a uh, 11 lab the doodle, Australian lab the doodle. Um, this picture was taken a couple of years back where there was a massive bloom of lupins here in Folsom Lake. And uh, when the water levels are very low, then we get this kind of bloom here in the Folsom Lake. Uh, uh, this year, the water levels are high, so we don't have a bloom like that, but he's he hangs out with me all the time. Yeah. Um, this is the medical panel I've been working with, um, Dr. Ajna at Kaiser. She's the kind of my primary oncologist. Dr. Jonathan Chow at UCSF is my other primary oncologist. Both were fellows of Dr. Eric Small. She came and worked at Kaiser. He's uh, he's at UCSF today. They they coordinate my care really really well because they have known each other for a while. They work with Dr. Eric Small, kind of trained together, and they they really are the kind of the primary caretakers of my um, uh, uh, kind of the decision makers. Dr. Manish Kohli, he's a very well-known academician and then uh, Jiu Ong. He's currently at Huntsman Cancer Institute, holds a bunch of these academic chairs and stuff like that. He's always a kind of go-to consult on the, the side. We know him personally very, very well. I can call him on a Sunday morning and he'll spend an hour with me on the phone and will just walk us through things. Um, he's very well connected in the industry, so he connects me us to many other people as needed. Uh, he's the one who made the connection to Dr. Antona Corus also. So he he's all, always on uh, consult. Also been working with the, the integrative oncologists for a couple of years at UCSF. You know, they kind of try to help with all the kind of the non-traditional methods and manners. Me, it's been a good kind of interesting journey to work with them. I won't say anything, you know, uh, fundamentally different has come out of it, but it's always good to have an integrative on call. So that's kind of my primary team. As I said, we have talked to many other experts in the past. I haven't stood them here, but I did do recent extensions, had a concert with Dr. McKay that any Is of you know. At, got it? Okay. Uh, Dr. Rana McKay. Um, 
uh, especially uh, especially this was related to the bat discussion that has been kind of hot and going on here, right? So I, I did have a consult with her last week, a full extensive consult. Dr. Emmanuel, we've reached out to him. He, I haven't talked to him. He said he will talk directly to Cho, and he did to discuss my case and then decide whether whether there's something worth pursuing or not. And I'll kind of get to that uh, in, a, in a bit. So. This has been my kind of journey to date. Most of you guys have probably seen this thing, you know, as uh, data oriented we are, we kind of try to track everything, you know, oh, PS, oops. You know, at one point I needed log scale because the PSA was kind of gonna go, go low, right? From 200 to 2.2 and stuff like that. But I'm kind of way past that. I'm running into the 400s and 500s now for past uh, 18 months, right? So kind of the, <laughs> the scale of a lot of this stuff is kind of, gone away. I started late 2018. I won't go through everything in detail, but you, you can see the treatments have gone through chemo, extendies, IT, all the, the ADP stuff over here, various radiations, radiation here, radiation, radiation, then went through the immunotherapy trial along with the, the lutetium as a, as a kind of primer. Really didn't work. You can see what happened in the immunotherapy trial over here during that phase. Then it started uh, chemotherapy again. It helped bring some control back there. The, the challenge with the the taxotier stuff, and then I was really really keen on Plovicto. I mean, for 18 months I was tracking. I was willing to travel the world to get Plovicto treatment if it didn't become available. We were fortunately it did become available over here, and when it did become available, we sw did switch to Plovicto uh, over here after after the, the chemo. Had three doses of that really kind of didn't, you know, it's unclear what it did or didn't do over there. And then things have just been kind of, um, you know, moving along over there. And I'm kind of back on this eighth line right now of uh, of chemo. And I'll talk about why and, and where we are. But I want to kind of point out radiation stuff. The, around this time, me, I have had focal radiation to take care of certain focal things over here. Last July is when I started to have massive spinal issues in my uh, lower uh, in in my lower uh, back, and that's when high dose kind of radiation stuff has started. And we'll talk about what you know how that whole journey has uh, has kind of gone um, in, a, in a little bit. So the big stuff and findings in past three months. Me, you know, beginning of the year things were starting to look okay. I'm done with Plovicto. We don't know what's next things, you know, at least I was symptom free and everything else, but it didn't last uh, long. In Feb, I started to have a very serious pains in my, ah, come on. In Feb, I started to have very serious pain in my thoracic spine. L July was lumbar spine, this time it was thoracic spine. N massive nerve compression from being on vacation in, in, you know, in India, in a week or 10 days, I couldn't even walk. Uh, so it was it was pretty bad, and uh, had to get uh, radiation treatment to take care of that, um, uh, which which helped over a period of time. But it le left some nerve compression issues that have persisted. I after that my walking has been unstable because I lost some nerve uh, 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 senses that haven't fully recovered yet. Same time the PSMA scan indicated that now the disease has infiltrated the bone marrow quite extensively. So the disease that was in the bone, and we knew it was in the vertebrae, it started to go on both sides. On one side, it started to kind of get into the spinal channels. On the other side, it started to get in the bone marrow. So it didn't stay in the bone itself at this stage, right? So on both sides of the bone, it started to infiltrate bone marrow as well as the uh, uh, as the, the spinal channels. So that reduced significant bone marrow capacity for me and other treatments didn't contribute, obviously, because everything suppresses bone marrow. Other finding that happened simultaneously was that my uh, biopsy showed that I'm not uh, pure uh, adenocarcinoma anymore. There's a 20% neuroendocrine component involvement um, in cancer. So now we are not just dealing with a prostate cancer, we are dealing with an endocrine component. And my medical panel has is most worried about that part also at this point. They believe that all the stuff that we've done with prostate and everything has also tried to manage and contain some of that. But it has given the chance for something else to grow and controlling that is 
the hardest part at this point. I was recovering from all of this stuff from Feb and March, trying to kind of rationalize my new uh, normality. And in April, uh, about two to two and a half weeks back, I started to get numbness on face. So actually left side of my face is very numb and it has been progressing. Um, I, probably you can't tell my, by my expression, but I'm actually pretty frozen on the left side of my, <laughs> my face. And that was an annoyance, at least it was in pain and annoyance. But what happened last weekend was that my vision is messed up. So I'm actually at my computer screen level, I can see okay. But at a distance, I'm seeing a double vision. So each eye is okay if I kind of just have each eye is okay. But the nerve pressure or what, uh, the stuff that has built up in there has changed the, the ophthalmic stuff that I cannot actually see properly now. So now I cannot drive. Uh, my walking, which was already impaired, now is further impaired because of, you know taking steps and visual stuff is kind of messed up. So anything four or five feet distance and beyond, I'm having difficulty seeing clearly. So, you know, I, I put an eye patch as needed and try to look like a pilot uh, mm. whenever I feel like, but um, that's that's all uh, how I'm managing, right? So the MRI shows compression of various uh, cranial nerves in a skull base. And then besides the cranial, and I'll share the MRI, the disease, what they're calling is, has become men meningeal uh, carcinoma dosis, or it has kind of, it is very ready to go in the brain at this point is kind of the concern, right? So so the, uh, so the quality of life, as you can see, is suddenly dr drastically shifted and changed in what I'm able to do or, or, or not do. And uh, that's obviously kind of where, where things are and, and, and the big concern is, right? So, so the medical panel's concern is this mutation and spread disease is out of control with no prophylactic pathways at this point. Right, and a split to brain and other organs is actually very hard to predict. So far, okay, it's bony disease; it'll cause pain. We'll know how to manage pain, radiate this and that. I think this is kind of my sense from the medical panel is this is out of the box now, and we just don't know. So count every day as a good day, and you just don't know what tomorrow might or might not be. Right, so. Here's kind of what's happening uh, in sharing some of the MRIs also. So uh, I had an MRI beginning of March, same MRI, and that was okay. That was non-actionable. Within four weeks, and this, uh, this MRI is from a, a, you know April 14th. Within four weeks, you can see the growth of the disease. This is the skull base and the kind of Meckel's cave area that's called. On my right side, you, there is kind of the uh, uh, compression, but it's uh, still okay. On the left side, which is what, where my face is frozen, you can see the difference between the right and left side in measurements, if you can tell, right? So so there's a, there's a pretty big compression over here that is causing my facial stuff to, uh, to, to kind of get all these nerves pressed. Uh, there's, a, there's a growth in temporal lobe area also. Uh, it's, uh, it's not marked, uh, supposedly it's not causing any symptom. But it may be hard to tell that there's the, the skull and brain lining, right? So between the brain and the skull, the, the dura that is there has white caking at this point. And that is the meningeal uh, uh, stuff that is that has everybody most worried about uh, right now. Um, so the plan is I'm starting radiation today. Actually, my appointment for radiation is at 11 o'clock today. I'm starting radiation to address this area. Uh, this area is not going to be addressed right now. And this area is not going to be addressed right now because it is actually, it's unclear if addressing this area will cause benefit or, or cause more cognitive damage and bone marrow reduction also. So it's just wait and watch and see where things go and, uh, and, and, and try to kind of deal with that. But what has my medical panel most worried about is more of this kind of stuff where things are getting kind of, getting in the dua and what will what will they do when they press uh, against the brain and loss of cognitive function. These are some of the older, uh, since we're talking about kind of how the, the spinal stuff has happened. This was July, 2022. This is my lumbar spine. You can see my L1, L2 area was completely compressed. So it disabled me. 
radiation helped me get out of that mess and uh, really kind of made me functional again. This is February of 2023. This time it was thoracic spine. This area is completely blocked off. So moved from lumbar, th lumbar thoracic to now kind of the head and the, the base of skull stuff. So that has been kind of how the, the cancer has moved from bone to my spinal uh, cords and stuff. And part of the, this is that the adult bone marrow factory or the large capacity areas are pelvic bones, which were radiated heavily along with the lumbar spine. My pelvic bones were radiated in July. The spine is the big area where bone marrow production happens. The radiation happened 22, 20, again, July in February, and I'm starting now. Breast bones is another area where good reserves of uh, bone marrow factories, and the skull, which is possible future radiation, which again, the concern is that it'll reduce more myelosuppression. So while I'm dealing with all of these and all the radiation fixes have been good to get me functional, the effect of radiation on bone marrow suppression has been actually meaningful. And now bone marrow, bone marrow, so to say, is the my limiting factor for treatments because my cell counts are very, very low and everything else suppresses cell counts further. So that's that has become a limiter uh, to, to what my kind of the treatment look like. Um, I've included this for data because uh, we love, all love data, but I won't go through in detail. But I was, for almost three and a half, four years, I was kind of keeping well with the treatments. I was tolerating them well. I was dealing with them. They, did, they weren't working, but I didn't have a tolerance issue with treatments and stuff like that. Uh, you can see hemoglobin kind of was, you know, not great, but it at least hovered around in, in a respectable stage. July, when I said the big radiation treatment happened and then quasi plavicto, all of that stuff happened between July and September. That's when my, you know, hemoglobin started to tank. And, you know, since then it has been kind of, okay, let's do something to prop up. These are my blood transfusions that I have gotten over past uh, um, uh, um, months to try and kind of prop up. As you can see, just about the beginning of April, me, I was at 64 Two blood transfusions later, I'm, you know, it has it has kind of propped up, and you can see all the WBC and RBC counts also, right? So yeah, we can I can get blood transfusion, packed RBCs, and all that stuff. Platelets really are the chemo limiter, right? My platelets dropped beginning of April, so so I started this chemo. So so the regimen left for me at this point was just to try and do chemo, and I'll kind of get into the details of why why that is specific chemo, but. The consensus was uh, carboplatin plus cabazitaxel is the chemo that we need to give it to try. It's not targeted therapy. We need nuclear option and try and see if that can help contain. Um, carboplatin is very toxic, but you know we had to take a chance with that. And uh, we started uh, with that on March 1st with a smaller dose. So generally they are three week cycle dosage. I was only given what, a small dose on a weekly cycle just to see what happens. After uh, three dosage, two of car cargo and one of cabazi, you can see how my platelets drop to almost kind of 60 level. You know, safe level is about 100 before you, you know, people try to treat you and platelets are not something you can prop up very easily or, and or in a sus sustained manner, right? So this is really platelets are the chemo limiter. Uh, so then I was on a five weeks break to get chemo. Um, it started to, did it did recover. I mean, of course I got blood transfused, two transfusions, but platelets did recover by themselves, which is actually good news. And then I did get another cycle of chemo last week and I, I don't have uh, data after that. But but this, this is, th this panel is kind of my life limiter right now in terms of, you know, I don't qualify for any trials uh, for the reasons that my, you know, hemoglobin CBC panel is very, very low. Um, I, the fact that I have a neuroendocrine differentiation, I'm rejected from all the trials at this point. So experimental stuff is out of the woods. You know, of course, we can talk about off-road therapies and things like that, but no systemic trial. I mean, I was kind of on the books for various trials we keep discussing with UCSF, but you know, right now, none of that is uh, uh, a roadmap option. 
So kind of where am I treatment option wise? Uh, as I said, chemo, uh, um, carboplatin and cabazitaxel are kind of the, the go-to um, options from the, the medical panel. Carbo, because it actually targets neuroendocrine, also it targets CDK12 mutation, which, is, which has been one of my primary drivers. It has some PARP inhibitor benefits, which is a secondary to all of that. And then Cabazzi is the remaining taxal to try and address the, the prostate cancer part of it, right? They've been trying to get to a doublet therapy to combine both of those things, but it is too toxic uh, and we have not been able to combine. Uh, I'm actively on this treatment, I would say, limited to small doses delivered in last two months, balancing, you know, so we, we look at things where things are, those decision when to give all that is made on a on a weekly basis just based on where things are right so that is kind of the, the primary path um effect of that on psa so to say uh really it hasn't been measurable the psa came down from 490 to 476 after the three doses so okay 15 points drop on a 500 really kind of we don't know and at this point team is less focused on PSA because it's not the new endocrine indicator, right? So yeah, PSA is interesting and we'll keep tracking, but that's not the only indicator for me at this point. It's about uh, um, everything else, right? So, so the primary path is really kind of, okay, what mileage can we get out of this and how much can I actually uh, tolerate this? As I said, radiation, Obviously, if I can unfreeze my face and fix my vision issue, those are huge quality of life issues for me right now. Uh, starting today, uh, it'll be a Tendo's setting uh, to try and uh, uh, address that. So we'll see how how that goes. Radiation full brain um, again address uh, compression on the on meningeal lining. It's a possible roadmap item. I have very debatable data from various panel members about you know, whether to do it or not do it. So it's not a decision that needs to be made right now, but it'll be, if and when it comes, we'll have to figure out if that will make sense. Um, if I am not able to tolerate these or uh, become the factory or they cannot be given, there are possible couple of uh, chemo options. Uh, there's a topo can. Which is which has nothing to do with prostate. It's all post platin neuroendocrine kind of thing. Our data comes from small uh, cell uh, lung cancer. May not be very relevant. It's a roadmap possible item. Again, I'm at a stage where there's not too much we can worry about because things change so fast and quickly that okay, yeah, it's there. When we have to make a decision, then we will figure out whether that choice is it still the relevant choice or not. And then the, another chemo, uh, uh, which is a kind of a Hail Mary effort for preventing organ metastasis. Again, very speculative, possibly a roadmap item at some point uh, uh, kind of thing. So none of these actually are prostate cancer related drugs. They are all kind of trying to now prevent prevent neuroendocrine growth in other parts of the, the body, so to say. So, so it's pretty, pretty limited and uh, uh, short kind of uh, list over here. I have some reject options over here. Uh, I'm sure there'll be you know more that are, is of interest to, to this panel, and I'm uh, sure I'll hear. Yeah. Olaptab has always been on my um, roadmap uh, because it targets CDK12. Uh, it's on hold uh, at this point because it's even more toxic than carboplatin. So carboplatin is kind of supposedly a poor man's olaparib. And if I cannot tol tolerate carboplatin, then olaparib is a dead thing for me. And carbo has a little bit more benefit at this point uh, with neuroendocrine than olaparib, you know, doing the CDK12 mutation. So it was always a roadmap item. We never got to it. But at this point, it's like, oh, this is going to be way too toxic for me to even, uh, even you know, uh, consider it. I know back has been a big kind of discussion. And as I said, um, because it's non bone marrow suppressive and obviously it'll target, right? Um, it has been rejected universally by my panel, including Dr. Rana McKay, who I consulted, 
uh, very recently, specifically for specifically for this. The the reason is that the at this point the concern is the the cancer is way too um, aggressive, and flare ups while for most people can be transitionary, it may be too hard to control, and the permanent damage that it may create paralytic damage could be you know could be very very unpleasant um so they just don't think this is i'm um, in the zone where this is even worth the roi or the risk so as i said uh all three of my oncologists rejected it dr reina was not supportive right from the very first time i asked her about back um Dr. Antinacoris, I mean, he's willing to say, hey, come up to my clinic in Minnesota and we'll review the case and then see where to go. I have to decide whether, you know, when and whether that will make sense or not, but the offer is open for him to meet with me in person in, in uh, Minnesota and uh, try to let him judge that, but I've kind of put that on back burner for now. I know thus has a hand up. Thus, do you want to talk, say something now, or you want me to get me to this? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, uh, Alaparib. Who told you it's toxic? Curious where that came from. My MO says it's not toxic at all, and the trials I've seen, it's, uh, it seems like there's a little toxicity, a few side effects. But uh, uh, who? I'm wondering where, the, where that came from. It's more toxic than chemo. More toxic than Olap, uh, carboplatin. Uh, multiple oncologists have told me that. Huh. Uh, the, okay. my, my medical panel oncologist. Interesting. Uh, Jonathan Chow, uh, Manish Kohli, all of them believe. And is even even more... Dr. Dana McKay. Even Dr. Dana McKay. Is, uh, I'm not, uh, okay, so they, they all say the same thing. Uh, um, is it more toxic in your case or because of white blood cells or, red, or some parameter maybe? It's yeah. it's for the bone marrow toxicity for my bone hemoglobin marrow. and okay. cell count for 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 okay. cell count for cell count stuff right so okay okay so Thanks. various trials again with, with, based on genomics and everything else we had you know ARV targets uh, bi-specific antibody CAR T you know I'm kind of as I mentioned all of them are off the table um, other drugs. You know, these are some of the other drugs that have come up. Not enough evidence data, although I have to focus on that. Um, there are a few open items, again, from Cure Match, again, based on uh, based on some of the uh, esoteric uh, data of, uh, you know, few genes here and there. But, uh, and I'll get into genomics in the next page uh, a little bit is, you know, th that stuff is very low priority for my Onco team. Me again, you can find like, oh yeah, there's a small gene here that this has this stuff, but they are focused on the bigger picture of what's happening rather than, okay, what if I address that a specific gene, which is a very small expression at this point, and we don't know whether that is a driver or not a driver, right? So uh, I had a very good conversation in the alley also last week on Cure Match Me. Again, I'm not, I'm keeping them on the list, but as I as I work with my medical panel, there's like interesting, but that's not actionable or where we want we can put focus, because putting doing something has a always a, a opportunity cost of not doing something else, and they are they have to make that call bedside on where's the right, uh, you know, what what is it that they can deliver rather than go chase a small nuts here and there, right? So that's pretty short list of things, uh, as you can see. My my real path right now is this, and this is for symptom relief, and this is kind of the systemic therapy at this point. Beyond that, everything is just like we don't even know what what can or or may uh, uh, may happen or not happen. Um, I'll cover a few pages on genomics, and then pretty much open to discussion uh, here. Um, I've been using Guard as kind of the reference point almost uh, periodically, so it's it's kind of a good reference point uh, over here. All these reports are on Google Drive. If anybody wants to take a look at that, uh, as I said, CDK12 has been a driver mutation, and uh, you know, it's, we've been tracking it. It's been there. That's why Olaplib was there uh, on the list always uh, because it targets that. Uh, besides, and Olaplib also has very weak data, by the way, on CDK12. So it's the only 
so to say, FDA approved drug that has some data, but that evidence was actually very, very weak. It seems like they snug it under at the last moment of, oh yeah, this can help. So it has been like, it has been, okay, interesting. We'll look at it, but you know, it is not like a massive belief in evidence on data. AR amplification, as I said, has been high. So that's why the bat was also uh, always interesting. Other stuff has been kind of pretty relatively low and kind of gone from being there to ND level. So you can see kind of how things have, things have tracked, right? BRCA2 was never there first time in the last report, something kind of showed up and that's where the uh, carboplatin helps with BRCA2 also. So carboplatin is now a little bit of a more multi, multi-faceted approach for me. So that has been my kind of the garden t- um, history. Well, I did, just for the reference point, I did Tempus XF plus panel because we are talking about uh, all, all of this. And really kind of the, the surprising thing is that there's very low set of consistencies between garden and tempers. And that makes this decision-making really, really challenging, right? CDK12, yes, both of them have it. It's there, it's relevant. Uh, we can debate what the reference allele frequency is, but we have known CDK12 as the, the, the driver, right? Everything else there was like, you know, is, is almost mutually exclusive between uh, Tempus and Garden, right? So if there is some D, uh, DNMT3 here, which wasn't in Garden. Um, there, there's mTOL, which again, they list that as variants of unknown significance. So they say it's not actionable, but mTOL is very high in case of uh, Tempus. You look at mTOL in case of Garden, it's non uh, you know, ND level. It was there a little bit and now ND level. So my kind of key thing is that there are very low set of consistent data points with which my medical team is like, okay, let's go make a decision to target this, this, this. I mean, CDK12, we have known uh, for, uh, forever. AR, we have known forever. Everything else is like, okay, interesting, but without consistent and validated data, it's like, you know, what are we trying to chase here? Yeah, we can include some mTOL stuff or ERCC6 stuff, but you're also calling it variants of unknown significance. Other reports don't show it. You know, so so it all goes back to how good is this data? And I think the industry, at least it feels like the alignment between industry and the medical practitioners on how good the data is and how to actually effectively use when things don't, match up across uh, genomics is is not there and and people don't have time to actually keep chasing small stuff right now here's the proteomics analysis it wasn't uh, it was done on tissue it didn't really produce again anything meaningfully actionable out of it i mean the uh, again won't go through the detail ar amplification ar proteins are high we've known that right uh, there's a tub three protein. They say maybe there's some likely benefit, but it's non-detectable. So it's there, non-detectable level, but maybe something can be done about it. And they they put carboplatins for ERCC1 protein in a unlikely benefit because of some resistance marker. So belief, uh, you, I've shown this report to all my uh, oncologists. It's like, don't know what to do with that. I think carboplatin has a good benefit for you and we are going to stay with carboplatin. That's kind of their experience with that stuff right now, right? So so w- what it comes down to is that it's interesting data, but it hasn't become meaningfully actionable for me or my panel to say, okay, really, really, this is cool. I'm going to, uh, it gives me an action plan and I'm going to go act act on this stuff. Um, so that's the unfortunate reality of all the all, 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 all the all the kind of the genomic uh, stuff that I'm dealing with, right? So as I said, carboplatin becomes kind of the, it's neuroendocrine CDK has some path inhibitor benefit and that has become kind of the, hey, if I can tolerate and take carboplatin, that is likely the, you know, a, a good option for me along with cabazitaxel. And if I can get to this doublet, which so far hasn't happened, that's kind of my uh, uh, my primary path. 
So that's all the data. Here's kind of, I'll just uh, now open it for all the feedback and stuff, right? Physical health and symptoms, it's just, you know, I'm getting like listed back so you can see, right? Uh, I, you know, in March, as I was recovering, I was thinking of EWOT and, you know, how can I strengthen my physical body, do this, you know, doing physio, everything else. Um, it's just like now I have a setback that, you know, significant setback in my body's weakness as well as uh, ability to see, ability to, you know, walk, uh, all that stuff. So I'm still trying to figure out, you know, what, uh, how to keep recovering from that while going through the treatment, right? Uh Roadmap is limited. I mean, the, frankly, the conversations are palliative at this point is, hey, you know, we can keep throwing toxicity at you at this point. Uh, but at some point, uh, this it, it's, there isn't much left here to, to throw at you. And you, we just have to make a decision where where the that line is. Uh, genomics, I've already talked about. Managing quality of life. And what's my best quality of life path is obviously a priority for me because you know without quality of life, life is kind of what what is life, right? So, so that's kind of where I am physically, medically, and mentally. On yes, we are doing a starting radiation. Hopefully, that will help unfreeze my left part of the the face and the uh, give me give me my vision back because without vision, what do you you know? all the joy of travel and all the joy of, you know, meeting people gets uh, significantly impacted. Um, I'm very focused now internally to try and do what are the most important things in my life at this point, because I really don't know what tomorrow is or isn't. And uh, the meningeal stuff, you know, stuff coming to the brain and paralysis, me those, nothing I can do about those concerns, at least, Again, we can try and radiate the skull, but it's not a it's not a simple slam dunk thing that what it might or might not do. So, so that's pretty much it. Okay, we have about fifteen minutes left in our time, so that was um, a lot of content. Um, there's been a furious conversation in the chat. I don't know if you've been able to see it, Amit, but let's start with no, Rick. I have not. Had, yeah, yeah, Rick had Rick had about eight or ten comments in your questions so rick why don't you take it away and then russ has got questions and jeff and uh brian i think so let's but let's start yeah, with because he had a lot to a lot of questions rick you're muted uh you're muted you're muted rick oh, sorry sorry some of these questions were more pertinent uh as we were going but uh I'll just run them down. Uh, Pluvicto, any biomarker to believe it was it would work? Did you have any uh, PSMA quantitation done? I had PSMA scan before and after. The focal areas of uh, my disease seem to have distributed a little bit. So things that were as dark were not as dark. So I think it probably helped in some areas. Right, but it didn't contain the PSA. It didn't contain the spread of the disease to other disease and stuff like that. It didn't give me extension of life, so to say, or time, and it probably caused more bone marrow suppression, also in the process. Okay, so you've had a fair bit of SBRT, right? Mm -hmm. Would uh, proton have been less harmful or less side effects? So I've had SBRT and VMAT, which is a volumetric modulated arc therapy also. Um, VMAT was needed because of how bulky my spinal areas were um, and uh, how uh, they needed to be treated. So, so far, uh, touch wood radiation has always been very effective for me. So I can't say whether proton would have been even better. I, I will think about it or ask, but uh, so far, Radiation has really helped me get out of the pickle. Uh, yeah. In those things, both SBRT and VMAT. Yeah. Okay. And then I think getting into the mTOR, um, mm -hmm. there is, um, you know, I'm looking for a way to help because I believe there's mTOR inhibitors. And mm -hmm. uh, at 53%, you uh well going to the 
CDK 12. I just don't even know. Uh, this would be, you know, something Richard might hop in on, but it looks like, um, you know, you have one allele that's mutated on of the CDK 12 and that's a loss of function, but at 53%, um, uh, I didn't see another one. Uh, so you have a single hit, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'll ask Richard anything you would interpret from fifty three per or fifty five percent, or you know, basically, you have one hit at uh, uh, for both the CDK twelve and the mTOR. Uh, so going to the CDK twelve, I have a double hit. You know, so uh, you have a single hit. Is there any? comments there i think i'll ask richard to let, shed light or but, maybe get, uh, get the... uh richard do you mean this richard yes the richard anders who always knows so much and always corrects me and uh, from <laughs> embarrassing uh <laughs> oh no i only i only correct you on the small number of things i know something about but I, I mean, I think that, and I don't honestly know anything here, but I think it's the problem that there are two conflicting liquid biopsies. I mean, you don't really even have a clear signal. Okay, then let me finish up and then anyone. Uh, so with the, uh, it's a missense on mTOR, but um, there are a variety of scores that you can predict the deleteriousness of a of a missense. Uh, so you know, back in I can't can't think of the name, but we would run uh, uh, various scoring techniques uh, or algorithms to determine uh, the deleterious nature of a missense that uh, you know wasn't one of the classics. So has anyone done that? Because these well, these two SETBP one these these two look like something could be done here because you, uh, you know, these are strong signals. So I guess no one's done anything like that to try and say, hey, this is no big deal. It's just a missense on this part of the protein, and we know how it's folded, and it's off here, and not a binding site. Or hey, this is right. This is not a good uh, missense. Has anyone done it? So, so, so when they report this as unknown significance, what does that? What 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 is it saying by itself? Okay, they they measured it, but they're saying it's of unknown significance. Yeah, the doctors will give you a different answer than a bioinformatics guy. Yeah. Um. So. It's in the unknown significance part because uh, there's no direct linkage to our knowledge. But, yeah, you know, just being a curious guy and I'm looking for mm -hmm. ways to help uh, mm -hmm. from a bioinformatics standpoint, we would mm -hmm. rate every variant. Um, got the score, the scoring but it's really a sophisticated scoring algorithm that goes across species. It goes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, inheritant or, you know, how old is this particular section of the genome? And it, and it uh, predicts uh, a deleterious score. And mm -hmm. maybe, because right now it's in this, we don't know what to do with it. A doctor will tell you, we don't know what to do with it. Uh, so, we're not going to act on it, but maybe since you, you need some options, maybe, uh, mm -hmm. maybe you would look at that. I, sure. I, sure. Uh, maybe, maybe, so I would love to maybe one thing you could do, I, it's, it would take time. It'd probably be expensive. I don't know if it'd be worth it, but you know, some of these variants of unknown significance, you just don't know. You just don't know if they affect the folding or the action. I mean, you know that they're a mutation, you know that they're not like wild type, but you don't know if it'll do anything. Um, sometimes variants of unknown significance are totally benign. They don't do anything and they're just a variant. Um, I, possibly what you could do is, you know, make a PDX model 
with some cells if you could get it and then test it on an mTOR inhibitor. And that was and that one of Brian's questions too about getting an organoid or doing some functional testing. With that, as I'm thinking about it, is that would tell you if the mTOR inhibitor knocked down the mTOR mutant, but it wouldn't tell you if the mTOR mutant was, you know, was actually driving anything. Yeah. Uh, I, okay. I, I I hear you. So getting an organite test, which I kind of saw uh, somebody had recently, right, requires live tissue taken live right now, and I don't have an opportunity at this moment to get another you know, live tissue that can be you know, sent to the lab within 48 hours of being taken out. I'm going to get a, a solid biopsy done from Tempus on uh, the tissue that's already there. Uh, it's it's work in progress. And then kind of see what uh, what comes back from the solid biopsy from Tempus on, on that particular thing. And then uh, kind of go, the, the question is, the, the question I get from my panel is interesting, but is that the biggest area that we need to focus on right now? And the answer always comes back from everybody. No, so well, so I'm, wait, I'm wait. just being honest. Who's 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 you're you're talking about your panel of doctors? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be a monolithic effort. I mean, you know, we can deploy other resources to to support what they're doing. You know, and so I, I, I wasn't, you know, using an, an organoid or building an organoid, I, I knew it was going to be difficult, right? Just because of the tissue challenge that you have. So I didn't, I wasn't putting all my eggs in that basket, but I'm wondering if there's some computational models just based upon, um, you know, the sequencing that you've done that mm -hmm. could help us understand the menu of treatment options. What do we think is going to work and which ones don't we think are going to work? And Brad, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know, we've got, uh, was it Magnus Felke at, um, uh, at uh, Clemson? I don't know if Pete Kane could potentially help in this effort, um, but it, it, it seems to me like you've got data. You've got some treatment options on the map. Can we at least be smarter about which ones we think are gonna work and aren't gonna work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm open to um, you know what we can do with this data, right? In parallel, uh, so adding multiple therapies right now is just very difficult because I'm not tolerating a, a single therapy <laughs> right now, right? So adding even more multiple therapies is like okay, yeah, we can, but you know, if uh, I first have to show that I'm able to tolerate or or, or, or deal with the primary therapies, so that's kind of where the the real time things is, but putting it on, on analysis and roadmap, absolutely. So um, maybe Brian, you and I can chat offline and see what kind of- Yeah, so so I didn't, I, so if we were to pursue uh, computational models, I'm sure we would need raw data. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know if you have any raw data? Well, we did XF plus panel just so that we can get raw data. I haven't asked for it, but I mean, that was the whole thing. You know, we worked with Tempest too, so that we can get the raw data. And, and then I'll have the solid biopsy stuff kind of going on and then get the raw data from that as well. And the solid biopsy you're going to do with uh, Foundation or? No, with Tempest. Just with so Tempest, that I okay. Have, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I know XF Plus is, I think, like 500 genes. So the raw data yeah. may, be, may be a little bit limited on that front, but the, um, but the tissue... Um, uh, hopefully could could potentially open up uh, more doors. Yeah. yeah. Gino has his hand raised. Hey, Amit. Hey, uh, hey. quick question with regards to uh, your AR levels, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I did, well, I missed, probably missed this, but what about your androgen deprivation therapies? I mean, have you had any of those things? Uh, yeah, I became the factory to those pretty early on. I mean, I went through Oops, wrong direction. Um, uh, extend these IT uh, stuff way back in the early early days um, uh, over there and became the factory. I mean, you, you can see that I, I, I got a little bit of control, but never, it really never kind of held things back, right? Maybe slowed things down. 
because what we observed was your mm -hmm. um, AR levels is actually the second or third highest in our database. Mm -hmm. So like for comparison, mm -hmm. Brian's level was 911 or something like that, and yours is 3,200 and change. So you actually have an extremely high AR levels. That's borne out by proteomics. That's also borne out mm -hmm. by garden health genomics testing as well. Yeah. So that's, in, I feel like that's a point of attack. So, uh, and, and that's something not experimental, that's something that you would you could go with the conventional therapies. Cabazitaxel is the conventional therapy that will address the AR, right? I mean, the taxanes. No, no taxanes right? address uh, tubulins. The, uh, okay, that, that's true, yeah. So for so AR, what conventional you're therapy? looking at, yeah, you're looking at uh, you know apalotamide, ensalotamide, you know all those, all those. Yeah, uh, Tiga, daralotamide. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so again, we we. Um, or the greater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like our Venus, ARV one ten or seven sixty six. I forget which. Yeah. Which one? The the V. I mean, we uh, talked about doing a V trial with uh, extending your Zytiga at some point or or doing a kind of a um it didn't the the data from my kind of panel was that it's very very low probability that retargeting will help but i i'll bring that up again yeah because your february biopsy had one of the highest levels of ar receptors that we have seen mm -hmm. and yeah. that's that's definitely something it should be important on the table and okay. she, you know, you know, he's, he's, I, you know I, th I think he's going to have a conversation with uh, Emmanuel uh, Antonarakis. You know, what what about bipolar androgen therapy? I I know it's I know it's sometimes it's can be risky, but um, with his high AR expression, he doesn't have TP fifty three, but um, it would seem that that would be a pretty good match for bat. I'm I'm not that conversant with it, uh, but you know, ensalutamide is one of the one of the pieces in the bad therapy, right? But you also you're actually turning on turning off signals, so you actually need to turn off the androgen receptor signaling, and with the high levels of AR, so you, I mean, conventional androgen deprivation therapies might be useful here. Mm. Uh, and and this was from you I know you stopped Cytiga uh, way back, I guess, but. It's, it probably need to get reintroduced these androgen deprivation therapies because that's a so um, uh, I, I'm on Lupron by the way. Lupron is a consistently uh, I'm on Eligard Lupron by the way. Okay. That hasn't gone away. Yeah, so that probably that, not. that was what one really that stood out for me. Your andro androgen okay. receptor levels is high when yeah. both us and and now Garden out. Has shown that. Yeah, 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 no, that 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 is known. So, uh, Lupron has been a consistent parallel. I'm, you know, every three months on Lupron, basically. Uh, so I, I should I should have been more clear about that. Yeah. Okay. Sheena, do you do you have any um targets uh for neuroendocrine disease? Yes, we do. Yeah, I, I wanted to kind of yeah. Yeah, uh, Amit does have in his report. I was looking through it. Does have some markers for uh, neuroendocrine markers. Uh, like chromaganin A, CHGA, I think he he does have it. I was looking for. Well. Yeah, he has an extremely uh, CH chromaganin A is definitely there. I mean, chromaganin A, synaptophysin, and CD fifty six. These are three markers classically used uh, for diagnosing neuroendocrine tumors. So his levels of chromaganin A is very high, like seven thousand plus something. And so, so are there treatments? that target uh, those expressions? There are typically nothing to target those three biomarkers. They are more to say you have neuroendocrine tumors, and when you do have neuroendocrine tumor, you you switch to um, etoposide platinum, which which is, I guess, part of etoposide platinum therapy is part of that uh, that cocktail, right? So yeah. I believe you have, you are on platinum and... and yeah. So etoposide is... Kind of part of the same platin uh, thing, right? So it open. I'm on platin, carboplatin stuff. Mm. Um, well, you're on carboplatin, which is different from etoposide. So etoposide is targeting topo two a. Um, mm -hmm. So I, th I think Mike Yancey had switched to that that regimen. 
uh, etoposide platinum. So you might have more insight on that. Uh, so my understanding is that etoposide is given as a doublet <laughs> therapy, not as a single therapy, and it is given with carbo, right? Yes, right. So so if I'm so they're working with carbo, if I can tolerate carbo, and then they and cabazi, then etoposide is an option on the table, but. Again, I have, no, etoposide by itself is not a single therapy, is my understanding. No, uh, no. They usually yeah. think, physicians usually think in terms of cocktails uh, when it comes to chemo cocktails. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so you're on carboplatin and, and uh, cabaxitaxel, right? That's a cocktail. Right. right. There's right. also right. cabaxitaxel, carboplatin uh, cocktail, and you have etoposide and, and uh, carboplatin. Uh, cocktail as well. cocktail right so so right now the priority is ca carbo plus cabazi so that you bo target both neuroendocrine and uh prostate uh, going to carbo plus etoposide would be neuro only targeting and it makes sense from our report the cabaxitaxel is basically an anti tubulin inhibitor so you you don't mm -hmm. have a resistance marker for an anti tubulin which is what the top 3 non detected meant you mm -hmm. don't have resistance marker for anti tubulin so you should respond to cabaxitaxel. That's uh, uh, right. But but for me, the the thing that really stood out stood out was your AR was like like number two or number three in our our database. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. okay. Let me just do a quick process check. We're over the hour. Um, Amit, do you have some more time? I, I do uh, till about ten uh, twenty or ten thirty. So okay. then I have to go. Uh, um, I'm, I will, uh, let Russ ask his questions. I might stop the recording and let us keep going, but, um, Russ, you had your hand raised. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I have a cold. That's why I'm mostly muted and I have my video stopped anyway. Um, I don't want to have you guys have to listen to my hacking or see it. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, if you did entertain that or you did it, I strongly advise using an oral testosterone undecanoic for one day or androgel even because they are or even propionate possibly, but I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even get, uh, they all, they have very short half-lives and the oral testosterone undecanoic has a half-life like two hours. So whatever you would see with it, it would be really quick and it would wash out fast. So if you ever did entertain that, I would definitely uh, advise that going a really short mm -hmm. half-life to see how you're reacting you know if somebody agreed mm -hmm. with that or if your mo would let you do that i agree um, with that. <laughs> then the other the other uh things um about the parp inhibitors there is there are other parp inhibitors that are not all approved that there's telezaparib i don't know if i'm butchering the name probably am uh it's uh it might have worse toxicity for you uh, a hematological parameter or toxicity but then there's and i, I think it showed uh i read a trial yesterday or the other day uh it, it it had better benefits or or it better benefits uh than uh olaparib um then there's uh rucarap rucaparib which uh i don't know if you've talked to them about that i don't i don't know what its uh side effect profile is the, getting another, the side effect profile is a very, very difficult <laughs> challenge that I've been kind of struggling with, right? Me, you have to kind of rely on yeah. the, 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 you know, oncologist to, to say that because I had this long discussion with Ali on that topic. So if there's a way to really quantify the side effects in various ways of uh, something. So uh, again, they, it's not that the some, I mean, thus, if you can uh, send me in the chat the names that you said, I'll kind of keep adding them to the list. I, I've gone through gotcha. many of those things in the past, and they kind of get kind of in the reject. Like we were just talking about the etoposide that you know brought up, right? Again, it's it's there possibly at some point again consider uh, looking at, but for the reasons that I explained, it's not on the table right now. Um, and then it's I, I think I have to get through. The yeah, top, yeah, no, no, sorry, I, the top I, size is very different as the top two. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're, you're so right. PARP okay. inhibitors have not been a big driver for me, right? PARP inhibitor. Again, um, what, these what, are not what, positive inhibitors. Uh, the, the two I mentioned are not positive inhibitors. They're, they're PARP. Did I say positive inhibitor? They're, they're PARP inhibitors. I, uh, I, like that's what I meant. Similar to Lapper. Yeah. Um, so PARP inhibitors 
other than CDK 12 targeting have not been a big target area for me so far. So my panel, if I look at all of the doctors, everybody is, I'm worried about the neuroendocrine right now. What do I do with that? All this stuff is very interesting, but I'm worried about where your neuroendocrine is going. Right, that's kind of where the head is for everybody, individually, for all the four doctors that I'm working with. Right, so so yeah, all the path inhibitors and everything else, we can keep having long roadmaps of things, which again, is always a good thing to have. But I'm just saying practicality is, if there is something related to neuroendocrine control, that is what is. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know much about yeah. neuroendocrine prostate yeah, cancer. Yeah. That is what is of most, uh, um, most uh, kind of so, interest. Uh, so, so Sheena mentioned a top aside for neuroendocrine. Um, did the doctors mention that? Yeah, yeah. It, th this is the same etoposide that. Oh, I see. Okay. About. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we yeah, we, okay. we have discussed it opposite. It it opposite is part of the, the has been part of the conversation. Okay. Yeah. Just I just to underline uh, Jeff Krolik had a couple of ideas just for quality of life. I don't know if you saw those, but they were things to deal with your pain. They're they're not the same kind of medical uh, neuroendocrine kind of treatments, but just for quality of life, a couple of ideas there. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look at the chat, but. Jeff, are you still on? Maybe you could just give voice. Yes, um, I am still here. Um, so yeah, I went with more of a, a complementary approach in quality of life, looking at um, uh, you know increased comfort, reduced um, pain. You know, all acupuncturists are not equally skillful uh, or are as knowledgeable with maybe. Uh, uh, some Chinese herbs. I mean, both of those have uh, some research to track record for improving uh, quality of life <clears throat> in TENS uh, machines, which are often used to relieve um, <clears throat> chronic pain. Related to that is a, is a very similar system called frequency specific uh, microcurrent. Uh, physical therapists can do that, and it's quite effective in relieving. Uh, many different types of pain um, and even generates um, uh, 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 a cell fuel ADP in a certain way that can actually uh, uh, you know, benefit some uh, cancers uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, reducing the load a little bit, but I wouldn't uh, go there for a treatment. These are really all, um, you know, quality of life, uh, palliative <clears throat> care kinds of um, things. Okay. I do go to acupuncturist twice a week. Uh, I've been kind of based on my integrative oncologist. Mm -hmm. I've been doing that. Um, I, I think it keeps me calm, probably it helps me. I, I, you know, it's hard to kind of isolate the effect of that, but I'm, I am actively in acupuncture as well. I will uh, look into your suggestion of the frequency specific uh, microcurrent stuff and we'll see whether that is appreciated. Yeah. 